Hi, I'm Alex Wacker from Board Game Co. and we're going to go over my top 10 favorite solo games. While this video has been on my list of videos to do for a while, the reason I'm specifically putting it out right now is because of COVID-19, the coronavirus currently is completely taking over the world the way we know it. it we haven't seen anything remotely like this since the swine flu back in 2009. And I'll be including a few links in the description down below about the importance of self-distancing, of separating yourself from people and the relevance of it. It's one of those things that it didn't really resonate with me, the importance and the relevance of it, until I saw the, the actual math and the numbers behind it. But it is an important concept. I'm not here to tell you what to do, but at least at least understand the, the reasoning and the concept behind self-distancing. With that being said, I figured now is a good time as I need to put out a list of my top 10 favorite solo games. Not so you can't play games with your spouse, your family, whoever you are or are not interacting with, but at the very least, here are 10 games that do play great by yourself if you can do that. Uh, so to begin with, I'm actually going to start take this list from the easiest act to access to the hardest in terms of convenience, in terms of, of accessibility to solo gaming, because solo gaming is its own little beast of getting used to what it means to play a board game by yourself. And if you stick around to the end of this video, I'll cover which of which of these games are my actual favorites from that list, meaning what's my own ranking of preference. So to begin with, starting from the very bottom, we have Sprawlopolis. Sprawlopolis is that big. It's basically a city building game where you take these little cards and you're going to lay them out on the table. What you're going to do is you're going to have a bunch of cards and each card has a scoring mechanism on the back of the card and the front is how you, is the actual city. And through those scoring mechanisms you're going to build this little interactive puzzle that sits there and says, okay, you have to get X number of points and these are the cards and the criteria of how you get points. Let's see if you can meet that goal. It plays really well, it's cheap, it's it's a tiny, very affordable, and this, this the way I would, I would compare this is this is most akin to having an app on your phone. It has a little puzzle-like mentality to it, but it's a little more tactile, it's a little more hands-on. It's very easy to jump into this and say, oh hey, solo gaming's not that, not that bad, it's a little interesting little puzzle going on here. And from there, we take Sprawlopolis, and we go to Friday. Friday is the next level up, and again, one of my favorite solo games. This is a little deck building solo adventure where you're Robinson Crusoe, actually I think you're Friday, you're helping Robinson, you're Friday, and you're helping Robinson survive in the island, and you're doing that by, well, building an ideal deck and surviving through the, the jungle. It's very vicious at first, it's very hard to wrap your head around what you have to do to actually win this game, but once you do, it's incredibly satisfying. I recommend sticking through it for a few games, possibly even looking up a guide, because at first it seems like how would you ever win this, again, little puzzle game? And then as you get through it, you, you sit there and try to optimize, and you make it harder, and you add the levels, and it really is incredibly addictive as soon as you understand what's going on. It's a little deck building adventure, plays in around 20-25 minutes, again, fairly cheap and accessible, a great solo game to play. From there we have the Oniverse. Now the Oniverse is actually a series of games. We have a bunch of them over here. And these are by Shady Torby, or Shady Torby, I'm not sure how to pronounce that name. But it's the Oniverse, it's a series of games from this one designer that all take place in a shared universe. Thematically, the only thing that really matters is the art and style are the same, but each game is its own unique little engine. And again, these are all puzzles. All these games so far, they're just puzzles. They're, they're a set of criteria of how to how to win a game and to go through those. Now, the universe comes with a variety of different games. This one's a bit of a roll and move game, but don't let that scare you off. It's still an amazing game. Uh, the Onir one is fascinating. It's a little almost deck building-ish, but kind of reverse deck building-ish. You're, 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 you're going through your deck trying to match up keys and doors. Very puzzly, very great. All these play games do play co-op, by the way, these ones at least, but the, I, I think the, they play far better solo. Sylveon is a bit of a tower defense style game. You're basically defending your, store, your forest from this raging fire and trying to optimize around that. Then from there we have Cassion, which is this tile building game. This is my favorite in the series, and I highly recommend, if you're starting with the series, I recommend Cassion the most. I don't know if that's generally considered to be the best one, but it's certainly my favorite. Very engaging. And all these games, by the way, well, let's cover Arion. Arion is a building your little airship game. Again, very, very addictive. They're all addictive in their own way. I recommend Cassion and Sylveon the most, followed by Onirim, Nadian, and Arion. But they are all interesting and 
fascinating in very different ways. Now, these games, all this, this whole Oniverse series is very well done in the sense that they introduce you to the games one at a time with all these different levels. So you, you start off and you're playing the introduction level and you're like, well, that's that wasn't really that interesting. And then you play the intermediate level and you're like, wow, there's really an engine here. And then you play the expert level and you're just blown away. The way he consistently escalates every single one of these by at introducing an element of complexity, it's really incredibly well done. I, I highly recommend this universe as a great entry point into solo gaming. From there, in terms of accessibility, it starts to ramp up fairly quickly. These all are great puzzle games. They're, they're kind of akin to having a phone app where you have a set of criteria and a goal and you gotta figure your way through them. But after that, now we start get, entering the, game, the realm of real games. And I don't mean that as dismissively, just it's a different context of gaming. So what I consider to be the most accessible next is probably Marvel Champions. Marvel Champions took the world by storm in 2019. Absolutely selling off the shelves. It's hard to get. You can barely get the base game, let alone get all the expansions. It's just completely selling. This is just a share. You build a deck, not deck building in the traditional sense, but you build a deck beforehand. It's a collectible game, but limited collectible. And you you buy, buy the cards, you build your deck. It's cooperative. You can play it with a friend. You can play it solo. I have found it to be more accessible solo, but it's also enjoyable playing with other people. So you sit there, you build your Black Panther deck, or whatnot, you fight against uh, you Rhino or pick a villain, and just, it can be very quick. Once you build your deck, once you get into it, once you know what's going on, you can play a game of this in anywhere between 15 and 45 minutes, and it's just fun. It's it's solidly fun. This went from us. This went from being an unknown to me, meaning I didn't know if I wanted to keep it after the first few plays. But each time I played it, I enjoyed it more, and I keep playing it. I'm up to something like 10 or 11 plays so far in this game, and that's that's a lot for me in terms of when I got this. A great great game and a great addition to any collection. From there we have, uh, well let's add an honorable mention of Arkham Horror the Card Game. Uh, both these games, both Arkham Horror the Card Game and Marvel Champions, drastically different themes, but they have a large degree of similarity in how they play and how they play cooperative, how they play solo. I personally prefer Marvel, I prefer Marvel, but I like Arkham Horror enough that I figured I'd make a mention of it. From there we have Spirit Island. Spirit Island is an amazing game absolutely incredible. All these games are incredible games. This one plays very well co-op, very well solo. This is the game that got me into solo gaming. I, I was very averse to solo gaming for a long time. I had played a few of the, a few tries at different games and they never really stuck with me. Spirit Island is the first one that really was thoroughly enjoyable and so thoroughly enjoyable that I sat there and said, well, if this was good, let me try out this stuff. Let me see what else is out there. Let me see what else I can I can get to the table. And this was really enjoyable. You're basically it's a cooperative game and or solo. You're defending your island against invading people. People aren't trying to invade your island, and you're these spirits helping the natives survive. And you do that with powers. Ultimately, you have all these power cards. You you sit there and you consistently add to your power deck. So you start off with four basic powers, and then every few turns you're adding new powers to your deck, and they all combine in fascinating ways of of little elegance. It's a little mathy at times, a little bit, you know, it's something that's hard to think through every aspect of how it plays out, but it's thoroughly enjoyable and thoroughly rewarding. It's a great solo experience. It's a great cooperative experience. Plays very anywhere. I, I would recommend it between one and three players. Once you get to four and five, it gets a very chaotic very quickly. From there, we have a Seventh Continent. Let me try to drop this. Seventh Continent is another game that is. Absolutely, this is a this is a beast. It's not hard to play. The rule book is fairly easy to get through. It is a narrative experience that is unlike almost any other game I have ever played. You're basically building out this island of you're on an island and you you pull cards and you add the cards to the tableau, creating this island and this adventure that you're going through. It is almost a choose your own adventure with a little bit of gameplay thrown on. And if you ever die, you can just start again with that knowledge in the in the game. You now know that when you went this way on the island, you actually ended up confronting a whole bunch of wild animals. And when you went that way, you actually found the artifact that you needed to to win the game. It, it is incredibly well done. It's a unique experience unlike almost any game I've ever played. It stands on its own just from a, just from being unique and it, it's very rewarding, very relaxing. It does play well cooperatively as well. I have found it to be much better solo. There's too much card reading where you're constantly pulling a card, looking at the card, analyzing what to do next, that it plays a, much more streamlined and much faster solo. It is a very rewarding game. It's a very choose your own adventure. Minimal gameplay but a lot of fun to go through. From there, we have two games. 
Warhammer Quest, the adventure card game, and Heroes of Turinoth. These are basically two, they're basically copies. They're, Heroes of Turinoth was the remade Warhammer Quest after Fantasy Flight lost the license to Warhammer Quest from, from Games Workshop. But I have not actually played Turinoth, I'm just bringing this up because this one's a little harder to get, so if you can't find this one, grab that one. They're both supposedly pretty good in different ways, but they are ultimately the same game. You can play it again, this is a great, great game to play co-op, you can play it with three, four players. I recommend it with one or two. It might be a little better, this is, one, this is I think the first one on the list that I think I enjoy more with two players than with one. Possibly Spirit Island as well. But this one is, you, you have these adventures, you have these heroes, and it, it really cascades very nicely. So if you're playing with one player, I recommend playing with two heroes. And then each of your heroes is consistently taking actions, but the actions play off of each other and help your opposing, your teammate effectively. In the meantime, you're confronting these monsters and you're you're going through this whole sequence of exploration. It's like a little campaign. This one's more campaign based and this one's more individual play based. But you're going through this little campaign and or individual play where you level up your character, you're consistently improving their abilities. Each time you do something, you're either helping your opponent, you're helping your teammate or helping yourself beat the enemies. But it's very puzzly but also more than that, it's also more than puzzly. It's it's rewarding. It's it's you you have these enemies attacking you, and you have to play out how everything's going to to go. And you have to prioritize where you have to spend your actions and your attack. But it's thoroughly enjoyable. It's very easy to get into. Very easy to teach. These it's an absolutely great game. From there, we start getting really complicated. Up until now, everything was accessible. Now we start getting into a realm of complexity that is intense. And we're going to start with what I think is the easiest of these three to get into, which is too many bones. And to say this is the easiest of these three is a statement of how complicated these games start getting. But I will say that they are also more rewarding. In addition to the complexity, you get a greater level of reward. Too Many Bones is by Chip Theory Games and is well, I guess I'll tell you now, it is my favorite game from this entire list of games. It is, a whole bunch of these are very up, high up there in my rankings, but Too Many Bones is by far my favorite. Too Many Bones, you're basically playing in this adventure world where you're Gearlock, it's a made up fantasy race, and you're, you're competing on this little, it's character building. I, well, that's, I guess the best way to put it is, ultimately it is the best, one of the best character building games I have, to the point that each character there are ga each character is more complicated than some of these games. Learning a new character is more complicated than learning Friday. It, it, it's incredibly nuanced and incredibly detailed, and every, every time you go through this adventure, you're consistently leveling up that character. So every character has a unique play style. Maybe it's a character that throws bombs. Maybe it's a character that has a, has a pet wolf, and you have to figure out how to upgrade your, your, your attacks and your wolf's attacks in tangent to play off of each other. And every time you go through this little scenario one day at a time, where you tackle the scenario, you beat the baddies, you get the rewards if you beat the baddies, you get you can get rewards whether or not you did beat, they have all these ways of showing that information, but you get the rewards, you level up your character, and then you go into the next day, and then you go through it again, and then you get the rewards, level up your character, you go through the next day, up until you have the final encounter with the boss, where you can try to beat the boss and win the game. And depending on when you tackle that final encounter, you might have a few opportunities, you might have two, three opportunities to do it before you possibly lose. But each time along the way, you're improving your character, you're improving your abilities, and you're, you're adding to your potential abilities to beat the boss. If I had one flaw, it would be that I find that the first half of the game, the primary part of the game where you're building up your character, can be a little easy, not significantly easy, not by a long shot, but a little easy compared to the final battles, which are insanely difficult. The final battles are really a challenge and really rewarding if you actually beat them. But it is... It is it, the the rule book is a beast to get through, an absolute beast. It, it's one of the possibly one of the hardest rule books I have ever gotten through. I recommend watching playthrough videos online. But the actual game isn't that complicated. I just think it was a fairly poorly done rule book. The game is not the hardest by a long shot. The rule book is a beast, but the, it is the most rewarding game, one of the most rewarding games I have ever played, and the most rewarding solo game I have ever played. From there we have Mage Knight by Vlada Shvatil. Mage Knight is again an incredible experience. Uh, this is very, very close to Too Many Bones in terms of which one I prefer. Ultimately, the reason I choose Too Many Bones is because while Mage Knight has a more absorbable rulebook and it's an easier rulebook and it's still character building and a richly rewarding experience, Too Many Bones I find slightly easier to get to the table. 
from these two games, Mage Knight is consistently, even if you know the game well, playing it solo is still a two to three hour experience, easily, possibly longer. Versus Too Many Bones, you can you can you can also do it day by day, which makes it a little easier. But you can go through Too Many Bones in I would say 90 minutes to two hours, as opposed to two hours. And the, both of them do have varying degrees, and depending on the scenario you pick. But Too Many Bones is incredible, Mage Knight is incredible, but Mage Knight is also, it's character building and deck building. You're basically going through a map that you're creating as you go. Each of the terrain tiles have different ways of interacting with the game. Maybe you're going into a cave, maybe you're interacting with a village to recruit new units, maybe you're going into a monastery, maybe you're going, maybe you're going into a mage tower to fight the creatures that are there, the mages that are there, and then learn new spells. Everything you do in this game is so powerful and so dynamic and so rewarding in the way that you're upgrading your character. Now, unlike Too Many Bones, it's not 15 different characters with each one being its own game. There's this one generic character, that's not true, that's not one. There's more than one character, but the characters are less nuanced, less uh, less individualized. They're much easier to jump from one character to the next, which is a pro and a con. It's slightly less rewarding to have the vast array that Too Many Bones does, but at the same time, it's easier to jump from one character to the next. That is Mage Knight. And last on the list, the Beast of the Behemoth, absolutely a, you know, a real chore to get into, is Gloomhaven. Gloomhaven, I'm worrying about my table at this point. Gloomhaven is, uh, I mean, Gloomhaven is just Gloomhaven. This is a game that I would say is also one of the few games on this list that's better with more than one player. It's better with two, but it plays incredibly well solo. You grab two characters. Uh, I recommend two. You could do it with one, but I recommend grabbing two characters, managing their hands, you know, going through the, the dungeon. But again, I would say Gloomhaven is very similar to Mage Knight. They're very similar games. But whereas Mage Knight plays out over a single two to four hour session, Gloomhaven plays out over 50 hour long sessions. It is much longer in terms of the full breadth of the game, the full breadth of the experience, but each individual session is much lower. So you're you're expanding that character building out over a much longer arc, which can be rewarding and frustrating in different ways, depending on what you're going for. If you like having a game that you get to the table and get you know done with pretty quickly, go with Mage Knight. If you like a longer rewarding experience that will play out over you know, months, if not a year plus, go with Gloomhaven. Uh, the, the rule books on both are a beast to get through. They're not hard, they're just a lot of information, but they're a thoroughly rewarding experience. That's basically it. These are my top 10 favorite solo games. I know there's more than 10, but some of these are series, so I double counted it, like all five Oniverse games I counted as one. In terms of my recommendations, I recommend starting off with one of the easy ones. Start off with a Sprawlopolis or Friday, or maybe Cassian from the Oniverse series. From there, Marvel Champions is a great, very accessible game, especially if the theme appeals to you. If you like Marvel, it's a great game to jump into and, and really dive into. From there, Spirit Island is a great choice as well. Spirit Island is fairly easy to get into, fairly easy to understand, plays well co-op, plays, plays well solo, very richly rewarding. For me, like I said, it was my personal gateway into solo gaming. And then from there, I highly recommend Too Many Bones. Uh, again, all of these games are incredible. They're all my top 10 solo games, but Too Many Bones is so richly rewarding. The the, the tactical gameplay is very well done. The, the rulebook wall of pain, you can sidestep that by just going to videos online of how to play. It is, it is, an incredible experience that I cannot, I mean, if you watch any review of Too Many Bones, this is a game that, that shines. People love this game and for good reason. It is expensive, it is hard to get to the table, it's hard to get through a rule book, but when you do, when you persevere, there's a real gem at the end of the tunnel. That's basically it. I hope you enjoyed my, my top 10 solo games. Uh, let me know which ones you've played. Have you played Too Many Bones? Have you played Mage Knight? Have you played Marvel Champions? Which of these is your favorite game and or did I miss your favorite solo game? There are a bunch of other solo games that I haven't played even that are would have made this list. Nemo's War is a game I haven't played that I want to play. V Commandos is a great solo game that I've only played once so I, I really want felt the need more plays before I could add to this list. There are a bunch of Kickstarter games with solo modes that I have coming. Which, which solo game is your favorite and why? Was it one of these? Was it something else? Let me know in the comments down below. You can like this video, subscribe, you know, let me know anything. If you have any opinions, thoughts, let me know in the comments down below. Always happy to hear from you guys. Until next time, I'm Alex from Board Game Co.